chapter 11 is where we're at as we continue this Life of Christ series that we're in. One of the things that we've seen in this series that's been actually really kind of enlightening is that Jesus repeats himself a lot on specific topics. The one that we're looking at is one that he repeated almost word for word, and this is the, the prayer that he taught us to pray. We'll see some other things as we go along today's message, and we'll see some other things that we see over and over and over again. I think it's because we're slow to hear, slow to learn. We need to be taught, and, and this is a section that, again, uh, he taught it up in the Galilee area, up around Capernaum and that, and now down around Jerusalem, and, and he's teaching this same thing again. So it's good to revisit it because we forget. There's sometimes, in fact, I was talking to um, our youth pastor here, and uh, I was saying, uh, it, was like, it was like maybe Tuesday. And I said, what did you teach on Sunday to the kids? And he goes, I, I taught, um, hmm, I don't remember. <laughs> and I go, I said, yeah, isn't that so true? So true. What did I teach last week that you that were here? Do you remember? Mm, yeah, right here, because this helps, because I just remind you by looking down, huh? But it is amazing that we need to be reminded to get so forgetful, so forgetful of things. And yet there's certain things that just stick in your mind. This last week, I sat in an audience where we all sang together, we all live in a... Is this weird how some things stick in your mind? <laughs> Lord, help the Bible to do that. You know? All right. So what happens here? We need, we need the Lord. They're watching Jesus pray again in Luke chapter 11. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. He's like, we don't pray like that. Teach us to pray. And he gave them a model prayer. He gave them something not to just, and we've talked a lot about this, not to just turn off your mind and ramble through this prayer. He taught us how to pray, and it's a great outline for a prayer. What do I mean? Well, if you've been here, you know, you can take this prayer and camp out on every single line of it. Some of every single word of this, and it'll enhance your prayer life in a huge way. We said, I want you to pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we kind of pause there and begin to walk through this. Our, collectively, remember? Our, right there, well, you camp out there for a while because when he uses the word our, I mentioned that it's a perfect word for right there. If I was writing a prayer, that's the word I'd put in there. God didn't ask me, but I put that word our in there because in the original language, it has two ideas. It literally means our collectively, but it also can be translated my personally. Isn't that an awesome thing? What a, what a color, see, we miss it in the English. What a colorful word right there, our it's our Father. You're our God. It's all of us together. And guys, I, it's hard not to camp out on here again because pulling together, doing things, this birthday thing, pull, doing that together, we could make a huge impact. Doing that with just five or six of you, well, we make a little bit of impact, but together we can do huge things. This Joplin trip or other things that are going on. As we pull together, say, we're, we want to together, because we're a family together, to do things to further the gospel. We can be powerful and, and, and do great things. What's well, also my God, your God, personally. We all see this little cliche, it's a personal relationship with God. And that's not a cliche, that's a radical reality. Praise God for that. Praise God this is not, and I say this over and over again, because I'm thankful for this. It is absolutely not just some social thing that we do. It's not just going through the motions. I'm going here to appease my bishop or my pope or my pastor. I'm going here because I have a relationship with the God that created me. I'm following God because it is personal. Do you see right there? That first word there, you say, well, I need... To, I'm not sure. I run out of things to pray about. That first word there will take you an hour. Hour as you begin to pray for the church. You begin to pray for those in the, in the family of God. Our Father. You're my Father. In heaven. And we talked about that and, and how to camp out there. In heaven. Remember who he is. And, and uh, in heaven. And someday we're going to be there. Our Father in heaven. Then hallowed be thy name to praise his name, to understand the reverence there is and the power there is in the name of God. And again, we camped out there and we spent a week looking at that. And this week, I, the last week it was, 
I really enjoyed it because I really need to be reminded of this one. Your kingdom come. It has to be your kingdom come, my kingdom go. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we spent the whole time last week there. Your will. I want your will in my life. And I need to be reminded. I love this. I just need to be reminded. God, I need your will in my life. Your will on earth as it is in heaven. Let me walk in a, in, a, in, a, in a way through this life, going through this life, listening for your heart and your voice concerning things that are going on. Help me, Lord, to walk in the reality of the grand adventure of following God. Man, what a, what a life-changing thing that is. And then we get to today. Again, I pray that you're taking time and walking through this during the week as you're praying through this prayer. He prays this, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Give us this day our daily bread, today, today. Proverbs 30 says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Daily, Lord, I'm going to trust you in the every day. It's easy to say that. Now, what if you lived in Joplin? What if you lived in one of those homes that were completely destroyed? It would change this prayer, wouldn't it? Lord, this day I'm going to trust in you for those daily provisions that I need. Now, let me put it in perspective. There's two ways of looking at this. One of them is, is that we need to put it in perspective to understand how truly blessed we are. I think you know some of this stuff. But listen, let me give you just some statistics is this. If you have food in your refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer, listen to this, you are richer than 75% of the world today. These are all true facts. If you have money in the bank, in your wallet, in spare change, in, dish, in a dish somewhere, you are among the 8% of the wealthiest in the world. You better tithe, my friend. All right. <laughs> listen to this one. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, you are more blessed than, than, than the million who will not survive this week. If, you ever, if you've never experienced the, the, the danger of battle, the loneliness of imprisonment, the agony of torture, or the pangs of starvation, you are ahead of 500 million people in the world. Wow. When you start looking at these perspectives, it puts things in perspective. If you can attend a church or any other place of worship without fear of harassment, arrest, torture, or death, you are more blessed than three, listen, three billion people in the world today that don't have that privilege that we have of what we're doing right now. When you put it in perspective, it changes it changes a lot of things. We were, this, this last week, we were there, we gathered together as a staff during the, the week. We pray together. We read the Bible together. We should. We're a church. Hello. Okay, you're a business person. You ought to do the same with your company. But you ought to come together and we pray together and we, we, we talk about the things on our hearts and the things that are going on and the things we need to prepare for and, th and various things that are going on. So we're getting ready for that. One of our pastors here is the pastor of um, the Korean group. Um, that meets here after we're all gone. There's another church that meets here, and, and Pastor Plo is their pastor. It's the Karen tribe from from Burma, and I love those people. And he came in. And he said this last week. He said it's the day of remembrance. Okay, tell us about that. What is that? He says we remember our family. Remember where we came from. It's the day of remembrance. Well, we'll tell us your story. It was heart wrenching. It changed, it changed our morning, it changed our prayer. It changed our perspective for that morning. He said he was a little kid, and I won't get into some of the graphic details, but as a little kid, he was made to watch his mother, his mother and his father murdered. And not just, it was a brutal, brutal rape and, and uh, mutilation. And she was pregnant, and just some of the, some of the emotions that came out through that. And he said, God, make me a man that honors you and lives my life or something because you spared me because they spared him. He had two opportunities where they, that, well, that, that one and another one that he, he told us earlier about, you know, they were killing the Christians, you know, are you a Christian? And 
Yeah, are you a Christian? He, and they, but this is the stories we hear. This is really going on. Put a gun to him. Are you a Christian? They already killed some people. Are you a Christian? Bam. Are you a Christian? Bam. You know, put a gun to him. Are you a Christian? He had already decided, I'm going to stand up for Christ. You know, and the guy said, he said, yeah. And the guy said, get out of here. Got him out of here. He's now a pastor. Puts it in perspective, doesn't it? When you start putting things in perspective, pastor, that's a real uh, hard story. Well, you need to understand this is not an easy world sometimes. And we get all hung up. We talk, we talk about daily bread. Do you realize how much we really have? Do you realize that America, and I'm not saying this to be harsh. I know I get letters when I say these things. But you realize in America, stand out at any, any mall. Look out at any crowd of people. We are an obese group of people. We are a people, we are a group of people that are completely out of control with our materialism. I know that makes some of you feel kind of uncomfortable when I say that and maybe want to go get a cookie or something. But I don't know. I don't, I don't mean to be rude. I mean to, to, to put it on the table and go, look, we talk about these things. And I understand we're going to talk about the other aspect of it because there is real hardship and difficulty. We can understand how blessed we really are. Let's use those things for the gospel. Let's redeem the time for the days are evil. Let's do everything we can to make a difference because in one moment... Things could change. We look off on the horizon. We don't know what's going to happen. It really could be. And again, we need, to, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We could step out of this place today, and we could have a nuclear holocaust in America, in major cities, and this day could change everything. Am I prophesying that? No, I'm looking down at just where everything's going. There could be a mushroom cloud over, over one of these big cities or several of them all at one time. Ah, aren't you glad you came to church? Happy thoughts, pastor, happy thoughts. <laughs> well, I'm not Joel Olstein. I can't do that all the time. But I can do this. I can say, I can say, church, we need to be a people that's in love with God, in love with God, and in love with one another. Lord, show us how to do that, what it really looks like, and making a difference in this world. Because he has really blessed us abundantly. The poorest of the poor in America uh, could learn some things from uh, those that, in, that we've met in Africa, that we've met in Jordan, that we've met all over the world that have absolutely zero but have so much faith. They put my materialistic faith to shame. Well, turn over to 1 Timothy 6. Let me show you this. Let's just look at what the Bible says concerning these things. Give us this day our daily bread. What does it talk about here in the scriptures? 1 Timothy 6. Look at verse 6. We'll start right there. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. That verse right there will blow away a lot of the, the, the network marketing or the marketing things. Hey, you want great gain? Hey, you want to get rich? You want to do these? 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. And, and, and you want to get, get rich and wealthy and all this stuff? Hey, this is what it is. You want great gain? Godliness. Be a godly person. And be content with where God has you. That's great gain. You want a biblical perspective? See, here's the thing that, that we've learned as we kind of go through even this prayer. Is that there is, a, there is a world view and there is a biblical God view. And they don't always meet each other. They're separated. So a worldly view is going to say, give me all that I can get out of this world. In a, in, a worldly, in a worldly view, it says that. In a godly view, says, let me take as many people to heaven as possible. My Bible says, go out and make disciples of all nations. My Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love people. That's what we're to be doing. And the world says, no, love yourself, give yourself, get your, build and build and build your little kingdom. Well... Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, we'll certainly carry nothing out. And listen to this. This is this is this flies right in the face of our culture. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. So you just wonder, well, what is what is contentment? I want to be content, godliness with contentment. What is contentment? He says here, food and clothing. With these I'll be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money 
is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, that's what some have done, but you, O oh man of God, you flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. What are we to be doing? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were you also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Look down to verse 17. He says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things. Notice this. I love this balance. He gives us all things to enjoy. So, so you're doing well financially. You're doing well. Well, praise God. That's a blessing from God. He gives you all things to enjoy. What are you to do with it? Let them do good, uh, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for yourselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. You want, so you're doing well financially. Praise God. Thank God for that. What a blessing that is. Thank you, God, for the resources that you've, you've given us. All right, what are we to do with these things? He just told us right there. You're to share. Be willing to help others. Get involved with those things. You know? I asked a pastor, this was years ago, a friend of mine about, he lives in, uh, he's pastoring in Las Vegas. And I said, how do you do that? I says, when you got people that are, that are uh, you know, gambling, making all this money, and they're giving it to the church, and uh, how, do you, how do you reason with that? You know, I was trying to figure out how to get my head around the gambling issue that he deals with. We deal with other issues here. There's different issues in different towns. And he said, yeah, I'd like to say, he said, you know what? The devil's had that money long enough. I'm going to use it for the furthering of the gospel. And I said, right on, right on. Praise the Lord. So, you know, some of those big givers, you know, those, those guys, tell them about us in Salt Lake City. I'll use it for the, the gospel too. And, you know, it's amazing. Pastors never share those little moments of, hey, you know, tell me, who just gave you a million dollars? Can I talk to them? All right? Because we've never met anybody like that ever. Until today, you're here and you know who you are. And you know what God's been putting on your heart right now. You know that God has been speaking to you. All right. No. Here's the thing. Do all you can to see people know Christ. Do all you can to help people. You can do a lot more. You can, you know what, I've, I've already told you this once. I'm going to say it again because I don't know how many, well, I'll find out how many cows we've given away. But, you know, one cow to a family over there in, in, in all the countries that it goes to, one, of the, one cow changes that family completely. They, 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 they hear about Christ through that. But not only that, because of the group that's given them that cow, not only that, but that changes their entire world. And most of you in this room, this is the reality, most of you in this room, you wouldn't miss 100 bucks. You pull that out of whatever. And if you ain't got to go put it on a credit card, all right? What? No, I didn't, I didn't listen to any Dave Ramsey stuff. I, I'm, la, 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 la. <laughs> God gave us credit, all things to enjoy. That means credit cards, right? Don't do that. That'll mess you up, all right? You'd be just like the government spending money you ain't got, all right? All right. I understand this. All right, okay, so let's go to the other side of this. Okay, let's get off of this. Here's the thing is that there really is concerns. There really is. To, I, I know that. You know, we know that together. There's times that are very difficult. You know, praise God for his provision. I can get story after story of when we came to Salt Lake City. I didn't know, I didn't know anyone here. I just started meeting people as we moved into town, praise God. And, and uh, we started losing stuff, you know, and the stuff, it's stuff. So what? So what? But I was wondering about losing the house, you know, because we moved here and, and uh, you know, I didn't want to go into the house going to foreclosure and we were looking at, at uh, you know, what it meant. You know, we moved here. I just started the church, you know. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know you, I didn't know you needed uh, all these things to start a church, you know, lots of money and power and all this stuff. You need supporters and all that as the way they start churches today. I didn't know you couldn't just trust in God and move out to a place that he was guiding you and, and not have a bunch of support money coming in. I didn't know about all that new ways of doing things. Hello? That's kind of cryptic, huh? No, I'm not bitter about that. It's just different ways of doing it, all right? <laughs> 
You think you need all that money before you start a church. I just think I need a whole lot of God to do anything. And money's whatever. We'll use it for the further. It's not about that. But we got to a point where God was teaching us to trust. And I found money. I found money in my Bible. I leave my Bible out. And I didn't go poor mouthing it. I don't like that either. I didn't poor mouth it. I just pray to God. God, there's, a, there's needs here. There's needs. And, and I leave my Bible. And I, I go back and there'd be money stuffed in my Bible. I thought it was a miracle Bible for a while. I started getting Pentecostal, TBN Pentecostal. And I started opening my Bible like this. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice, you know. And I'd be looking for money to fall out, you know. I don't know. I still this day don't know who was, who was doing that. You know, there'd be, there'd be uh, someone would, would ring our doorbell and, and, uh, and there'd be groceries there for our family. What an awesome thing. I'd feed it, first of all, to the dogs. I didn't know where they came from. Here, <laughs> watch that dog now. That dog dies. I ain't eating that, you know. But we saw God's hand move over and over and over again. You know why? Because he's faithful. I absolutely live this. We live this. We, we believe in this principle. We have, we have hammered this in this church. Is, and you've heard it. There's, there's, absolutely, I don't believe there's a month goes by that I don't, I don't bring this up. God guides, God provides. Amen? You've heard that. You've heard that because we need to live that. There are some concepts that, that following God that we need to have ingrained in us. It can never be about the money. It can never be about those things because then we're following mammon. It can never be. It has to be God guides, God provides. If God's providing, then we're excited. We're going down that road. If God's not providing, we need to back up and see what's going on. Is this the direction we need to go? Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Let me, let me show you something else here. So when it comes to finances and those things, we're not going to worry. I'm going to get the other side of it. Yeah, we're doing well in America. But there is times, and this is real, when it is difficult, when it is hard, when you have concerns. Well, Jesus addresses that too. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse, look at verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Do not worry. Verse 31, therefore do not worry. Verse 34, therefore do not worry. Do you know what he's telling us right here? Don't worry. Don't be stressing. Don't be striving. Don't be worrying about it. He says this, and we'll, give, we'll talk about that. He says, um, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they're neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not more valuable than they now notice here he says with the apostle said that with food and clothing there we should be content jesus says look why are you worrying about that food and clothing those necessities why are you worrying about that look god takes care of those things which you by worrying can add one cubit 18 inches to your to your height can you change that thing or why do you worry about clothing Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither the toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God had so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, oh, you, oh, you of little faith? You even notice that, the logic of this thing. You know, God takes care of the birds. He's going to take care of you. His, you're his child. He loves you. Therefore, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles seek, those that don't know Christ, those that don't know God, they seek after these things. For your Heavenly Father knows that you need these things. He knows you need them. So here it is. Get your priorities right. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Get your priorities right. Kingdom of God first. Priorities right. Kingdom of God first. Lord, sink that in our hearts. And do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own. Sufficient for the day, it's its own trouble. Don't worry about it. You worry about the, you don't worry. You look at what's present, not the worry of the future. We're going to trust in God in that. Now, let me tell you what he's not saying in this. He's absolutely not saying that we're not to plan for tomorrow. In fact, he would balance. I love this about looking at the life of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, because he balances all these things. He said, well, then I'm just not going to plan. I'm not going to worry about anything. Uh, no, you're not going to worry, but are you not going to plan? He would tell us a story in Luke chapter 14. Which of you intend to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest 
when he has laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. And all who see it began to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish it. He gives a story. Look, you need to be planning. But what does that mean? Ask God to define that. What does that mean? I think there is a, a wisdom in being out of debt. Absolutely. I think that's biblical. I, I joke about the credit card and all that. But in reality, scripturally, I don't believe we're supposed to be in debt like that. Not at all. I don't believe you're to owe any man anything. I believe there's a, there, there, you ought to try to get out of debt. And Dave Ramsey, I'm going to just, let me just back up and redeem myself here on this point. The Dave Ramsey's uh, uh, series that we teach in the church has helped a lot of people. So how many people has been through that and, and has gotten out of debt or and you're on your way out of debt doing that? See, look at that. Look at how much, and that's helped a lot. We could do testimony time right now. We can't do it because you guys are too weird and say weird things, but, but if we could do testimony time, <laughs> testimony, I'm going to testify, Pastor, that hey, I, this is, and I was able, and here's the thing. The thing I do like about the Dave Ramsey, and I have seen some of them, I see the last one specifically on giving and tithing. I do like that because once you get out of debt, then further the kingdom, do things for the, God, for the gospel. You know, I love that heart. He says here, we're not going to worry. So it's not that we're not going to, we're not going to prepare and have God to define that within you. You need to be good stewards over, over your job. You need to be good stewards over all those things. That's important. But also, he's not telling us to not be concerned about things, live in la-la land. I'm concerned about a lot of things. Something so simple as, as uh, when my when kids and grandkids, uh, you know, they can't, my grandkids now are real little. And, and no, they're not going in a parking lot without holding one of our hands. We're just on a, a ride yesterday, a bicycle ride with, with the, for the prison ministry and, and watching those kids. Hey, if they weren't my kids, but I still, I'd love those kids. And, and uh, watching them make sure they don't get out in the street and that. Have some concerns. This is not a safe world. It's the, you ought to have some concerns, parents. It is not a, the Internet is not safe for your child at all. All right? The Internet is not safe for your child. You think, well, my little precious so-and-so, he would never, she would never get into things. It is not a safe place. It's not a safe playing ground for our kids at all. And these games, do you watch, do you see what these games are doing? Do you watch these, these first-person shooter games that our kids are playing with, good Christian kids are playing with? What is wrong with this generation that we think that that's okay? It's not okay. It's not okay at all. I was at a pastor's house. By the way, he's no longer a pastor. But I was at a pastor's house. And as a kid, I went over, I went over and, and uh, uh, was kind of sneaking around and, and, uh, and, and talking to his kids. And, and uh, you know, he invited me over for dinner. I'm going to see what you got going on. And um, his kid's in the room playing a game, playing one of those first-person shooter games. And I said, I said, hey, I said, does your dad know you're playing this? He goes, yeah, my dad bought it for me. He goes, watch what I can do. And it's, it's a first-person shooter game. He goes up to a guy. We, you know, he walks up with his little thing, walks up on the screen, walks up, puts a gun to the guy's head and shoots the guy in the head. And he goes, watch, and his helmet flies off before he dies. And it's, it's gory, and it's, and it's like, and I went and rebuked that, I rebuked that man. I said, you know what, you see what you're, and this was a little, this was a little kid. This was about a seven or eight-year-old. I said, see what, you see what you're, pastor, you see what you're doing? Do you see what you're doing here, what you're letting your kid get involved with? Oh, it's just a harmless game, it's nothing. Oh, that pastor, that Kevin Chapel pastor, I told you he was going to do this. Yeah, I'm going to do this. That ain't right, and I rebuke you in Jesus' name. That ain't right. You're letting your kid put that, and you wonder why. Every so often in the, in the news media, we see kids go on campus and start shooting people or wherever. That's pretty, that's pretty heavy stuff. You know what? There is things to be concerned about. And if you just live in la-la land here where you don't pay attention to things that your kids are involved with, your kids will go in directions that will, will shame you and will shame your family. Don't do that. Don't let them go there. Say amen or oh my. All right? You just look at me like, whoa. whoa, whoa. <laughs> I ain't got kids. I don't like kids. Talk about something else. <laughs> well... There is, things to, there is things to be concerned over. That's the difference between worry and concern. Worry is things is completely out of your control. And most of the stuff, write down all the things that you worry about. You write down all the things you worry about. Put that thing away and get it out in a year. You realize how foolishness worry really is because most of that stuff never even comes to pass. But concern is present things, and we need to be concerned. We need to be watching. There's things that we can change. I don't like abortion. 
and I have a heart for that, that whole, that's something, well, I just don't worry about it. No, I'm concerned about it. I can do something about it. I can support the Pregnancy Resource Center. I can help those that have abortions, tell them that there's forgiveness in Jesus and healing in Jesus, and that God loves them, and we can, we can make a difference. No, you don't stand up with some stupid sign with some aborted fetus up there. Stand up there and you think you're going to make a difference that way. All you're doing is making everybody mad, including those that love God. That doesn't, it's not through those things. It's a love of Christ that compels us. It's a love of Christ. If you're one of those sign carriers, you're in the wrong church. Right? I'll thump you in Jesus' name. Right? You stop doing that. That stuff angers me because that does not help. That does not help. That hurts. That does not help. Well, you just got to show them in their face what they're doing and all of that. There's enough guilt to go around. I don't care if you know Christ or not. If people live with guilt, instead of magnifying the guilt, you let the Holy Spirit speak to that person. You shine Jesus to them, and you point them to Jesus, and you, you let them see the love of Christ in you that you really care, and they'll be drawn to him. Let your light so shine before men. Let your light shine, not your stupid signs that you put up, all right? I love first service. I get all this stuff out of my system, all right? Thank you for letting me do that. Don't worry about those things. Are there things to be concerned about? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. All right. So, I think I did a message sometime in the past. If you're dealing with worry, all about worry. I remember doing a Sunday morning, all about worry. Some things to deal with the worry. So go back to this prayer. Go back to, to Luke chapter 11. Go back to this thing. Look what it says. Again, it's, it's, it's so, you can't just skip past this. We've got to camp out on this and really put it in perspective. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day. Today, I'm going to trust you in the today. And I want to have a good perspective of this, God. And you, uh, 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 you, you start seeing how much we're blessed and how much he desires for us to give and to be involved and make a difference in this world. And when it is tough and when it is difficult, you'll watch him take care of us over and over again. Yeah, but I'm homeless and, and I don't see God doing this. My Bible says when you follow him, when you follow him, He's right there. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's walking with you right there. Man, I love following God because he does walk with us day by day through every situation, through every trial, through every, every glorious moment, through every down, depressed moment. He's there. So give us this day our daily bread. And then he says this one that's, that's harder for me. That one's easy. I trust in you, and, and um, it's easy right now. That may get harder later. I mean, I, it, these just, the, all these things we're talking about takes turns in my life. But forgive us our sins. I like that one. Forgive us of our sins. I want to be forgiven. Thank you, God. Forgive me of my sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Or as, as he taught us to pray earlier, forgive us, of our, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Is this serious? This whole issue of forgiveness? It is serious. Matthew 6, he said this, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, their sins against you, if you do not forgive them, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses or your sins. That's heavy right there. You don't, you don't have to forgive. You don't, you don't get to forgive. You have to forgive. You have to forgive. Okay, great. I've been hurt really bad. That person really wronged me. So God, you're going to have to show me how to do this. And he does. He says, I want you now to, I want you to give that to me. A pastor once told me that you, you, need to, you need to learn how to play tennis with God. That's weird. I'm not a yuppie. I don't know anything about tennis, right? Tennis. How do you play tennis? I'm a middle-aged fat guy who doesn't play tennis, drop dead on the tennis court, right? So, so what, what are you talking about? Well, when the ball comes in your court, ba-boom. 
that you should talk about badminton. I like badminton. <laughs> I could do that one. All right. Okay. But when it comes to your core, sorry, that was a weird image. But when it comes to the, comes in the, comes into your court. When it comes in your court, what are you gonna do? You're gonna hit that thing back. You're gonna hit it back. There it is again, Lord. I hate that person. And I have unforgiveness. Boom, hit it back. Oh, okay, I'll give it to you. There it comes again. I want them dead. I do not like that. Now, I'm, I'm talking serious because, you know, we may talk, we may not say this, but there's times that there's been offenses that we've thought this, and, and maybe not even those terms, but the hatred is an ugly, ugly thing, and it gets, it gets super ugly, my friend, when you wrap it in religiosity. That is the most offensive garbage in the church today is we wrap hatred in religiosity. People totally come against this church and saying, well, we're just doing the right thing before God. God has told us to do this or that. And they are ripping and tearing at the body of Christ. God never told you to, maybe the God of this world told you, but God never told you to do that. Forgiveness. That's a harder one. Give us this day our daily bread. I like that one. Forgive. Forgive. I don't know, maybe, maybe you don't, see, there's, again, we struggle with different areas in our lives. That's one I've had to really struggle with all my life. It's hard for me to forgive. I was never, and before Christ, I was never a forgiving person, ever. I hate you, and I hate you forever, you know? Um, then you come to Christ. Okay, I hate you, and I'm working on it, right? <laughs> a year later, I don't hate you as much anymore, you know? I don't hate you as much. Yeah, I don't hate you as much anymore. I mean, it's a process. For some of you, maybe it's really easy. Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. This is Romans 12. Do not set your minds on high things, but associate with humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of man. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. I like that. <laughs> do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Heaping coals of fire on their head. There's been all kinds of commentaries trying to figure out what he's talking about there. Most of them would say culturally in this, in this, in this, in this background here that that was actually a good thing. That uh, that they would carry those coals on on top of their head, and then we see this. In, in fact, we saw this in Africa. It was very cool uh, watching a person go down the street, and they had this. This, this metal looking basket thing, but I don't know how it was, how it was made, but they I looked at it was smoking and there was coals on this person's head. And I thought, you know what? I, I always wondered if that was true. There's actually, I saw that. And I went, that's cool. That actually is going on right now. So that's cool. I like my version of it. Burn them, burn them, Lord. I'm gonna do good things to them so it burns them. So they'll be under conviction and they'll get it right. I don't know that that's the heart of God ever, except repentance part of it. I don't know. The thing is this, is that when you have that unforgiveness, it becomes like a cancer to us. It becomes a bitterness within us. And I used to work with senior citizens. And I had a whole, 157 grandparents, and I loved it. I did that for 10 years. I love that. I see them in heaven. So many of them were just good friends. But I watched what what, as you got to the end of your life, what it did. If you had a life that was filled with Jesus and, and there was a joy and you learned to play this, this badminton or tennis with God and you learned to, to give it back and you didn't hold on to this negative garbage of unforgiveness, you saw a difference in their spirit. I also saw a difference in people that were spiteful and someone just would not forgive, that distant with their family at the end of their life. And I give you tens of... Ten, Bunch of stories on that. Of just people that I met that my heart was broken. They're so bitter and they hate their family, their kids so much at the end of their life. And it's terrible. Why do you do that? Get rid of that stuff. Get rid of that stuff. So you got unforgiveness in your heart. 
All right, here's what you get to do. God's going to bless you in this. Here's what happens. The minute it comes up, you give it to God and turn it into a praise. Begin to praise God. I love the songs that we sing here. It's a reminder. Pick up some of these songs. Begin to sing them in your heart to God. The Bible talks about making melody in your heart to the Lord. And that, boy, that's a good thing. So that unforgiveness starts coming in. That person comes to your mind. That offense comes to your mind. Some of them are really bad, I know. I've heard some of your stories. We have horrible stories of things that injustices that have happened to people. I know they're, they're there. Give that to God. Give that to God. You don't know how hard. Give it to God. Give it to, and when it comes back, give it back to him. When it comes back, give it back to him. Because he said, if you will not forgive, you will not be forgiven. So he's not going to say that to us and not give us a way to deal with it. So when you have an issue with someone, you obviously go to them. You know all that. All the scripture says concerning that. Go to them alone. If they won't listen, take two others with them. If they won't listen, tell it to the church. There's a whole process, Matthew 18, that tells us how to do these things. But if you've got hatred in your heart, this is, what I, this is what I do. I find myself, I get really angry. I get, uh, I think cuss words sometimes. You may not. Pastor, you think cuss words? Yeah. I try not to let them hit my list, but I think that sometimes. And I try to use that as a trigger to remind me, I need to worship God. I need to turn my attention on to God. So you'll hear me saying, you come here in the day, ask the secretary, so I'm singing all the time. I'm always trying to sing something, you know, and just trying to keep my focus on the things of God. I try to change it from... Um, you know, some of the, the pirate songs of the Pirates of the Caribbean and that, but, you know, or Henry the Eighth, oh, am I am, I was married to the girl next door. You got to not do those, all right? Praise songs, praise songs. The Bible says it this way. It, it says, train yourself towards godliness. Lord, help us to do that. So as we pray this prayer, we go through it. Our Father in heaven, he's our Father collector. Our Father, we're going to camp out there who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I'm going to praise your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to camp out right there and I'm going to pray, Lord, I want your kingdom, my kingdom go, your kingdom come, the Lord. The Lord's coming. I'm going to, I'm going to be, pray I'm ready for his, his second coming. I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And I'm going to ask you, God, to, to, to search me. Are there things that I can be doing better with the provisions you've given me? And am I worrying about things? I'm going to give that to you. Give us this day our daily bread. And then I'm going to get to this one. Help me to forgive, Lord. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. There's so much to be forgiven for. Now, Lord, help me to forgive the way that you've forgiven me. Oh, we still got good stuff ahead of us. But I'm guaranteeing you guys, if we'll pray this together, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer, it'll change your prayer life. It'll change your life before God.